So to this audience, it's not going to be a surprise that our brain, that the brain development does not end upon embryonic development. Actually, after we're born, all the way up to adolescence, our brain continues to undergo many important processes that are, that are important to its proper connectivity. These processes are collectively important for what we call neuron, re, neuronal remodeling. And despite the fact that they actually do many different things, uh, the key thing is that they are uh, basically sculpt the mature connectivity of the nervous system. In my lab, we're interested in uh, neuronal remodeling processes that do not involve uh, cell death, uh, the, the death of the neuron, but actually are important for specific, specifically rewiring of the neuron to uh, form a different connectivity. Probably the most uh, classical example of uh, neuronal remodeling is the development of layer 5 cortical neurons. This was discovered about 40 years uh, by Denis O'Leary and others. And as you can see here, early on, these uh, neurons, layer 5 cortical neurons, from very different areas in the brain, so layer 5 cortical neurons in the visual area and in the motor area, initially form identical connections both to motor-specific uh, regions such as the spinal cord and to visual-specific regions such as the superior colliculus. And only later on do they undergo selective axon elimination in a way that the layer 5 cortical, region, cortical neuron in the motor region uh, eliminates uh, its uh, visual-specific connections and the neuron that resides in the visual area eliminates its motor-specific connection. So despite the fact that this was uh, discovered about 40 years ago, when you go back to the drawing of, of Ramon y Cajal, you can see that he knew this already more than 100 years ago. And here you can see he's drawing a Purkinje cell uh, in development. So this is an early cell later, later. And you can see <coughs> that these neurons early on have very elaborate <coughs> and small den dendrites that are undergo what he called at the, at the time process resorption. Today we can call it dendrite pruning and to give rise to a much smaller dendritic tree. And later, this dendritic tree enlarges, matures, and, and basically forms the adult dendritic tree of the neuron. And um, over the last few years, there have been many um, um, hypotheses that maybe, uh, that, that think or, uh, or hypothesize that defects in neuronal remodeling might have a basis for neuropsychiatric diseases such as autism, schizophrenia, and, 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 and others like that. Um, but the fact, and, uh, but one of the reasons that we don't really have a good causal link is because we don't really know the molecular basis for uh, how these neurons undergo uh, pruning of these uh, branches and regrowth of these branches. And for that, uh, the model system that we are using is Drosophila, which is a great genetic animal because it has a short uh, lifespan. It's really heaven for geneticists, but it is especially well suited to ask the question of neuronal remodeling because of its, uh, of its uh, life cycle. So it starts as an embryo giving rise to a larva. And then during metamorphosis, its larval brain has to undergo massive neuronal remodeling to give rise to the adult uh, brain. It's important to mention that, of course, many new neurons are born, many neurons uh, are die, but many neurons retain their cell body, but just rewire the connectivity, and this is exactly what we're interested in. Most of my lab is interested in one cellular structure uh, called the mushroom body. This is a structure that is important for learning on, uh, of olfactory stimuli, um, and this structure is uh, comprised of three different neuronal types that are sequentially born from four, from, uh, four identical per each hemisphere, four identical uh, neuroblasts or stem cells, and these neurons, uh, um, only the neuron that is born first undergoes neuronal remodeling. The second neuron, despite the fact that it actually exists during metamorphosis, does not undergo remodeling, suggesting that this process is cell type specific. So how does this remodeling look like? Our neurons are unipolar, meaning that we have a cell body. Uh, here just showing schematically four cell bodies, but we have about 500 per hemisphere, and we have a small dendritic tree and these neurons have a bifurcated axon. This is how they look early on. This is how the larval mushroom body neuron look like. During pupa, these neurons completely eliminate or completely get rid of their dendritic tree, and they also eliminate their axons up to a very specific and stereotypic point. Um, it's very interesting to see that really, I mean, there is some sort of morphological change also to the axon uh, a little bit above this point, but somehow uh, this part is protected. We have absolutely no idea what really determines this uh, point and whether this is a cell 
autonomous process or it has to do something with interaction with glia. It's really an open question. And then later on, these neurons undergo uh, developmental axon regrowth to form the adult-specific lobe, which um, is very different from the larval uh, lobe. First of all, you do not have a dorsal lobe, a dorsal axon, but also even the medial axon is, uh, projects to a different place and is very highly and stereotypically branched. So one of the cool things about the Drosophila is that we can visualize this in up to a single cell resolution uh, inside an intact brain. So you can see here a single cell clone with the dendrites and with a bifurcated axon, a two cell clone where the dendrites are gone and the axons have, are gone up to very, this very stereotypic point, and an adult specific uh, clone that has this uh, adult specific connectivity. So um, work from various labs, including mostly Leach and Lowe's lab where I did my postdoctoral studies, have found that a nuclear receptor complex uh, comprised of a Dyson receptor and ultraspherical absolutely critical for the transition between the larval and the pupil stage and they're really uh, um, if you mutate either one of these transcription factors then these neurons do not undergo or do not initiate axon pruning. Work from my lab has shown that uh, another nuclear receptor complex comprised of E75 and, and, and unfulfilled are critical for the next transition and essentially without them these neurons cannot undergo developmental axon regrowth. And if you, two nuclear receptor complexes which are essentially ligand dependent transcription factors regulate both of these transitions uh, what Idan, a graduate student in my lab, decided to do was to uh, or, or the idea behind this work was that um, there must be some sort of a transcriptional uh, program in these neurons that regulate various aspects uh, of neuronal remodeling. And this is exactly what you did. And this is one of those slides that you have one slide to describe more than a year of work. But essentially, what Idan wanted to do is he wanted to sequence these neurons. Um, so we're talking about a small population of neurons, of very small neurons inside, the, inside an intact brain. And he wanted to sequence them at various times during development. And for that, he had to identify a good way to label these neurons, a good way to dissociate them, and a good way to sort them. And again, again it took a long time. But at the end, what we, found, what we have is a good way to isolate uh, about 1,000 cells, which give us robust uh, uh, or enough RNA to get robust RNA sequencing, which was done in collaboration with Ido Amit, who's not only uh, a good friend of mine, but he's also, I would say, one of the leaders in the field of RNA sequencing from small quantities of RNA. So this uh, is a global correlation view of the sequencing that we've done. And what I want you to uh, see here is one that we did a lot of developmental time points. So actually, in pupa, between 0 hour and 30 hours after preparing formation, we sequenced the neurons every three hours. And this was not something that we initially wanted to do. We actually, in a previous experiment, we did less time points. But it was clear from the results that we needed a finer developmental resolution. And this is what we've done. The second thing that I want you to see is that for each time point, we did either a triplicate or a quadruplicate. And the samples are very similar, suggesting really that the sequencing is very, very robust. The third thing that I want you to see is that here shown as a control, but of course, we're also interested as in astrocytes. But here shown as a control, you can see that astrocytes are a completely different animal than the neurons. Of course, uh, we're talking here, there's a, um, uh, they're not correlated to the sequencing of the, of the neurons. Um, and the, the, third, the fourth thing that I want you to see is that most of the global changes in the sequences of these neurons occur either in the early transition, so in the early stages of pupa, and then between 9 and 30 hours after pupa information, essentially. And again, it's not, it's not that there aren't changes in transcription, but globally looking, these, uh, there aren't many changes in transcription uh, in this block. And then when you look in adult, and this was, I think, one of the most surprising uh, results for me at least, when you look at adult gamma neurons, what you find is that they're actually more similar to other adult gamma, other adult neurons, not even neurons not from the mushroom body itself shown here, compared to themselves just a few hours earlier. Suggesting really that, or, ask, or raising the question of when is the cell identity really defined, how you define a cell identity, how many markers do you need, to define a cell identity is really an uh, 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 um, interesting thing to think about. OK, so that was a global view. But of course, we're interested in the actual genes. So here, what each line is going to be an expression of a single gene. And red is going to be its maximum expression. Blue is going to be its minimum expression. And essentially, what we did is we clustered the expression of these genes together. 
And here you, I'm just showing you some of the clusters uh, because I want you to see, again, the development of time points. And here I'm plotting also when pruning occurs and when regrowth occurs. And what basically the idea is that if a expression of a gene peaks at zero hour after pupil information or at three hours after pupil information, these genes are highly likely to be important for developmental axon pruning. And this is just to show you the entire uh, clustering cluster into 10 different uh, clusters. But the first step um, that we wanted to do is essentially, okay, we have these nice clusters of gene expression, but is it really what we expect? How robust are these sequences? So what we did is we looked at the expression patterns of genes that we know are important for pruning. And of course, the first one is the cadizin receptor. This is the gene uh, that I mentioned in the beginning that is a key uh, nuclear receptor that is important for uh, axon pruning. And you can see very ni nicely that its peak of expression is at larva, and then it starts to go down, and essentially it's pretty low during uh, the rest of development. When we looked at two of the known targets of ecdysin receptor, it was very satisfying to see that the peak was slightly delayed, but again you have a peak of expression at about zero hour after prepare information. Next we looked at two um, protosome subunits that were again known to be important for neuronal remodeling. And again, RPN6 and MOV34, both of them have a peak at zero hour after prepare information and going down. And in fact, when we looked at the entire family of the protosome subunits, it was, I would say, quite surprising and very striking that all of them clustered together within this cluster and having a peak at zero or three hours after prepare information. Okay, so we have these nice clustered expression of genes. We have, we, we um, validated them by looking at genes that we know how, what, what their expression pattern should look like. What do we do next? So one thing that we are already doing is we're trying to look at uh, interesting genes that come up from here and trying to do, uh, we have a lot of hypothesis driven questions that we're working on. I might say a word about this towards the very end, but as a first uh, attempt, what he done decided to do is actually to have again keep the global view and essentially look at transcription factors and other DNA binding proteins. So these would be chromatin uh, remodeling proteins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And among these develop, uh, developmentally changing genes, what there are 200, about 250 DNA binding proteins that he done looked at and clustered them again according to these same clusters. And what he then did is he categorized. Uh, uh, each cluster or some of these clusters according to clusters that he predicted that would be important for pruning and some of the clusters that we would be important for regrowth. And he looked at the uh, genes that were highly expressed. So this would be the pruning clusters. You can see these guys have a peak early on. These specific guys actually have a dip of expression exactly at the time where you expect them to be important for pruning. And um, these guys have a peak of expression later on and therefore they're we predicted that they're important for regrowth. And what he did is for each one of these 50 genes, he did RNAi experiments within the brain. And you can see um, that all of these Ps, these are pruning defects. Uh, all of these Rs are, uh, are brains that have a regrowth defect. And all of the ones that are orange are actually new findings. So these are genes that their role in remodeling were not known. So I think it's not bad if uh, we look at 50 genes, 10 of them are actually important for remodeling. Seven of, seven of them are new. It's, I think it's pretty remarkable. And just to show you what I mean by this, um, uh, um, I'm going to show you just an example of some of our RNAi experiments. This is how a adult mushroom body neuro brain look like. And here we're showing, uh, of course, not a single neuron, but a bundle of neurons all going to the medial lobe. There is no dorsal lobe. This dorsal lobe is actually another neuron. I told you that the mushroom body is comprised of three different sequentially born neurons. This is the last uh, born neuron. The cell bodies of these neurons are inside the... Oh, sorry, every time I move here, you probably wake up. So anyway, the cell bodies are inside uh, the, the uh, screen and they're not shown here. We took them out in a con by the confocal. And here, just showing you again, all these experiments, you can see that the arrows are showing you these unpruned gamma neurons in these cases, and in this case it shows you neurons that did not regrow completely to form the adult specific lobe. So again, just to show you that the sequence is not only nice, robust, nicely clustered, but also we find some things that are functionally relevant. The next uh, step in what, so, so for the next step what Idan decided to do is he decided to look at key transcription factors which we found 
uh, uh, which we know. I showed you already ecdysin receptor and, and uh, ultraspherical, which is not shown here, but I'm showing you here again SOX14, E75, and E75 and ANF here as well. And um, what he decided to do is he decided to mutate these key transcription factors and see two things. First, can we generate some sort of hierarchy between these transcription factors? And the second thing is, can we learn something between, from these mutant sequences, from the sequencing of the mutant neurons, can we learn anything about the downstream programs that are uh, downstream of these transcription factors? So first things first, let's see about the hierarchy. So here we're looking at the expression of SOX14. This is the wild type expression, peak at zero hour after pivot information. If we express RNAi against SOX14, not surprisingly, expression goes down. Again, not surprisingly, if we express a dominant negative version of ecdysin receptor, the expression goes down. This is not surprising because this interaction was known already. Ecdysin receptor was known to activate SOX14. What was surprising was that when we express an RNAi against E75 and specifically look at this development at time point, you can see that the expression of SOX14 is highly elevated and essentially suggesting that at the later time point, E75 inhibits the expression of SOX14. These sorts of analysis led us to uh, propose the following hier hierarchical model. And actually, you can see that in this hier hierarchical model, we actually pro uh, propose that E75 inhibits the expression of SOX14 by inhibiting the levels of ecdysin receptor itself. All the orange lines are new lines, and all the white lines were lines that were known. And I'm just going to show an example of one line that we uh, validated, but we actually validated all three. So here you're looking at the cell bodies of these mushroom body neurons. In magenta, or here in white, you can see the expression an antibody uh, uh, standing for ecdysin receptor B1. And here in green, or here, here in white, is a clone that is expressing RNAi against E75. So you can see that within the clone, where E75 levels are reduced, the levels of ecdysin receptor are increased, validating this arrow. And again, as I mentioned, we validated all of these arrows and we found that this uh, really forms a nice hierarchical tree. So the next, of course, and more interesting question was, OK, but what happens to the expression of all the other genes? The idea, our idea was that if we now have the expression of a wild type, and at this, so now because we're looking at mutants, we didn't do all of these time points. We did four time points, larva, 0, 6, and 12. We focus on axon pruning for the sake of this story. And now again, we, you see that this is, these are neurons that are mutant in ecdysin receptor, mutant in E75, and mutant in SOX14. And the question was, can the perturbations in gene expression following these mutations, can this tell us something about these developmental clusters? Can it actually divide these clusters into different subgroups? And you can already see, for example, if we look at this cluster 2, you can already see that there is a group of genes that is specifically regulated by SOX14. Uh, uh, this should be actually 14. I don't know why it's 15, but it should be 14. And there, the other groups are not regulated by SOX14. So we thought a lot about how to um, show this graphically and how to show this quanti quantifiably. Then this is what I'm going to show you now. It's going to take me one minute, and I have two minutes left, so it's going to be OK. Don't worry. Um, so again, we're looking at this cluster, cluster number two. So here. This is the expression. This is uh, the expression of the wild type, and again, you can see a peak at zero hour after prepare information, and it's expressed the same in cluster 2A, 2B, and 2C. And this division, of course, is based on the response to the mutation in these three different transcription factors, which you can see is very different. So, for example, here in the ecdysin receptor mutant, and here you see the box plots of the expression of these genes that express uh, ecdysin receptor dominant negative. You can see that this peak of expression is gone suggesting that this cluster is regulated by ecdysin receptor. The, change, the expression is not changed in E75 or in SOX14 RNAi, suggesting that this cluster is not regulated by both of these transcription factors. What this sort of analysis shows you nicely, or can show you nicely, is that, for example, this cluster is regulated by both SOX14 and, e and uh, ecdysin receptor. But at this specific time point, E75 actually uh, when E75 is mutant, the expression of these genes is elevated, suggesting that at this specific time point, E75 actually represses their expression. Okay, so this is nice. We developed, uh, we divided the developmental clusters into into uh, different clusters or subclusters that are um, that were responding differently to the different perturbations, genetic perturbations that we did. 
Um, but is this uh, functionally relevant? And it was very nice to find that all the protosome subunits were in this specific cluster 2A, suggesting that all the protosome subunits are regulated by a receptor and not by SOX14 or E75. So analysis like this, and really we're, uh, um, I'm going to show you really in two different, two more slides. Analysis like this allowed us to uh, generate a temporal sequence of events that give rise to or that occur during neuronal remodeling. And you can see that indeed in t on the top of the hierarchy lies the ignitin receptor nuclear complex, which, and we found another subunit of this complex. This is another uh, part of the study. And the first, early on, what you have is the activation of itself, activation of two different downstream trans transcription factors, and activation of a couple of subclusters. Then you have the activation and inactivation of new clusters by E75 and SOX14. Then you have the inhibition of ignitin receptor, <coughs> inhibition of this cluster, and et cetera, et cetera. And if we now, on top of this, add also some of the new transcription factors that we found, you can see that uh, this nicely uh, um, <coughs> intermingles and essentially it shows you a nice map of how um, these neurons regulate remodeling. But of course, these clusters don't really mean anything to us. So what we wanted to do, in, and this of course is just a simplification, but what we wanted to do is replace some of these clusters with the enriched Go terms uh, uh, within them. And again, we're going to repeat this entire thing. This is going to be the protosome. Then you can see that SOX14 regulates, upregulates a wide variety of, uh, of de degenerative diseases, such, uh, complexes such as the caspases, autophagy, and endocytosis. And um, then you have activation of other processes, and uh, because of lack of time, I don't have time to describe them. So to summarize, what we found is that, or what I described today, is that we um, generated uh, or what we, we did is we, we um, produced a de very temporally fine developmental RNA sequencing, uh, and this really revealed expre uh, clustered expression of genes and gene groups. And we found this allowed us to find 10 DNA binding proteins, seven of them are new, that are required for various steps of remodeling. And by perturbing the expression of specific transcription factors and looking at how that affects the expression of specific developmental clusters, we were able to uh, isolate and identify um, distinct functional groups that are hopefully going to uh, teach us more about uh, uh, neuronal remodeling. And with that, I would like to thank uh, my group. Who, these are the people who really did the work um, and who make it really fun to come to lab every day. I want to thank Ido Amit, who really helped us with all the RNA sequencing. Amos Tanai, who I didn't mention at all, but really helped us with the analysis of, of showing you how uh, uh, the subclustering analysis. And with that, I'm open for questions. And thank you very much.